Hello. All right, so I'm going to continue on with the chapter 63, Surmise and Evidence. In several of the cases reported here, the patient revealed through subsequent years of contact many indications of a basically unhappy home situation. And one of these parent marriage was apparently a relation in which both husband and wife, by their virtues, succeeded in avoiding the customary manifestations of their unfulfillment in each other, of their unadmitted but deep frustration. It does not appear that they failed to love each other in many ways of that word, but there is a good deal to indicate a serious lack of response to each other as mates, a lack not confined to central matters. Whatever hollowness or disillusion each sensed in the guarded privacy of its own awareness was bravely suffered and outer indications of chagrin or complaint were avoided in the best tradition of honorable conduct. The missing of fulfillment was, it seems, attribute, attributed to the universal fate of man and with little or no conscious cynicism both Marital partners found considerable compensation in construction social activities. The spontaneity and personal contact lacking in relations between the man and wife were not lacking in the less crucial relations each had with friends and acquaintances. In fact, they both were more than ordinarily social, informal, and even fun-loving. They did not, however, have either delight or real understanding together. What could not be fulfilled in the most important channels sought out in secondary relations and activities, enriching these beyond what is ordinary? Without insincerity, this surface of happiness conveys strong impressions that the couple was proportionately happy in central areas, such an impression they themselves apparently shared. Both husband and wife, adequate, mature, and wise in so many respects were able to avoid neurotic symptoms, sexual infidelity, cynicisms, etc., despite their deprivations, but even by intelligent and commendable efforts, they were, it seems, unable to convey to their child many feelings for which his needs was extreme. <clears throat> It would not be correct to say that they did not offer affection or that they were consistently too strict or too lenient in matters of discipline or teaching. From the patient, 30 or more years later, it was not possible for me to obtain information that seemed a reliable guide to what his real own real affection, effective reactions might have been. In the integral process of supplying the complex emotional needs of their child, it is not hard to believe that their handicaps were comparable to that of one, however wise and learned, who were comparable to that of one, however wise and learned, who must undertake to make love chiefly with his intellect. Okay. Let me repeat this. In the integral process of supplying the complex emotional needs of their child, it is not hard to believe that their handicaps were comparable to that of one, however wise and learned, who must undertake to make love chiefly with his intellect. Okay? There is no proof of it, but some reason to wonder if this boy gradually realizes the fact that centrally in his parents, something essential was missing or somehow unreal. If so, it is likely that he never succeeded in comprehending the nature of what he surmised only by its absence. Let me repeat that. If so, it is likely that he never succeeded in comprehending the nature of what he surmised only by its absence. Let's look at the word surmised. Sorry.
surmised, supposed that something is true without having evidence to confirm it, okay? So what would he be trying to prove something that without having evidence? Where am I at? Don't get lost, Cornelius. Surmised only by its absolute, what would he be trying to prove that he doesn't have evidence for, but only by its absence? What does he mean by this? He never succeeded in comprehending the nature of what he, I guess, assumed only by its absence. Well, could that be loneliness, perhaps? And he can only feel that because he doesn't have anybody in his life, or maybe because of his alienations. So only by the absence of people can does he feel this sort of nascent feeling of loneliness that creeps into his uh, conscious awareness. But he doesn't have any proof of this, right? Because he doesn't have any human relations, or he doesn't know how to really connect with people. So how can he know it's coming from a lack of uh, human connection when he doesn't seek these relationships out? I guess that's what he's trying to imply here of what he's trying to comprehend. Um, and this is only due to, the, this is the result of his confusions due to his unnurturing uh, and unloving parents. Uh, it became incomprehensible to him about how to seek love out. This became crippled in him. This is a disability. Yeah. Ooh, this is so crazy because a lot of men are dealing with this right now. They're not in touch with their emotions to know that they even need love, though they're seeking it out unconsciously. Um, and they can't comprehend, they can't succeed in comprehending the nature of what they surmised only by the absence of not having love in their life, <clears throat> that they're lonely, that they're needy for this, they're desperate for this, and they're codependent for it as well. That's what they cannot surmise and comprehend, the nature of this nascent feeling that seems to creep up inside of them. But I'm going to keep on going because I'm getting distracted right now. Is somebody speaking to me this morning, guys? Oh. I'm just so excited. Who is this? I can't pronounce your name, but hello. Hello. Oh, how you figure that? Fear-based survival instincts. Hey. <laughs> so fear-based survival instincts will be unconscious, right? That's a, that's a mechanism. defense mechanisms, right? Uh, so we have a defense mechanism for love, though we're seeking it out unconsciously. So what would that look like? Us showing like we dislike somebody when we really have an erotic desire for them? Can we say that that's what's influencing men's behaviors these days? The unconscious aggression and loneliness and rejections that they're feeling is actually getting them to unconsciously seek out the objects of their secret erotic desires through the objects of what they actually hate. Or am I going the wrong way with this or your point? Because we're talking about defense mechanisms, right? So what does the man do? He creates reaction formation, displacement, and projections onto the objects of his desires, reaction formation specifically. So whatever he don't like in himself, it turns into more of a ingratiation. Now he's going to lavish the trans girl with love and adoration, opening the door for her and everything, right? You ain't gotta buy that coffee. Let me get that for you. I love to get star fucked at Starbucks. At Starbucks. <laughs> They'll fuck your wallet up. 
I'll be so happy when I get my free coffee. All right, I'm going in a whole nother direction. Ah! Well, obviously it has a conscious effect because they're reacting on these uncontrollable urges or these un unconscious urges or could, should we call them compulsions, right? To go after the object of their desires. But why does this now kind of annex at, or why does this regress into some sort of sexual erotic now fixations or desire or craving or urge? It's this more pres preservation mechanisms kicking in automatically does the man get bored? He doesn't know what to do with his time idly. He just resorts into sort of extroversions of a sexual nature. Is this biologic? So why he responds in a sexual way? Since these are defense mechanisms due to his aggression, right? Help me out here. You got me thinking. He says, I think this instinct makes you do what's good for yourself. Okay. And Cliquey says, psychopaths can't appreciate art like normal people. So are these psychopaths seeking out art the same way that a normal person who wants seeking out art, I guess for a sense of culture or, those, I'm just referring to like those deep intrinsic think, way, reasons why we seek out beauty, art, and we connect those sort of nostalgically to things that we want in our lives to be that are beautiful, of harmony. Do you think that psychopath is also thinking deeply like that as he's at the museum with the butcher knife under his trench coat, walking around inconspicuously looking at the artwork? <laughs> or is he really looking at the artwork? <laughs> Maybe he's looking for his next victim. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> So are they appreciating the art? Or are they appreciating their next victim? <laughs> That's the question. I don't know. <laughs> Thank God we're not psychopaths, right? <laughs> Side eye. <laughs> All right. I hope you're doing well this morning. How's you sleep? I'm going to assume you're Indian. I don't want to make an assumption. But if you are from India, I love India. Uh, I had a trip there once that I took with a friend of mine. We went to Mumbai and then we went to Goa. Both beautiful trips. I can tell you a lot. I can tell you a lot about it. It was nice. We took the train as well as locals, no security, no red carpet, nothing. We sat there crunched up, balls to ass. Yes, that was the most exciting 45 minutes of my life as I'm smelling some guy's armpits. Why am I going off on this story? I was supposed to read this book. You see why I get distracted? Don't speak to me. I mean, it's focused. I'll be locked in. <laughs> <laughs> Leave me alone. <laughs> All right, so we're talking about instinct to take your question serious or your comments serious. Yeah, we're talking about defense mechanisms. Reaction formation is one of them. I don't know why I always revert, uh, make a trans attractions as an example of that. The reason why I've been doing that is because I've been just noticing and been coming into my conscious awareness of what this man really 
really liked in this trans woman um as i'm realizing that it has it doesn't have anything to do with energies but that's going to be a whole nother topic um it's all built in the imagination of his own erotic desires this kind of plastic barbie doll that he's trying to manufacture and this artifact in his mind and that's the reason why God is getting me to think of, so I'm focusing on psychopathy because they're not in the touch of the bank of what normal people, what you're talking about, these defense mechanisms, they're not in touch with those, but they're doing it purposively, unconsciously. And if we're gonna say that these defense mechanisms are conscious, which is what you were just saying, they're conscious effects. I think they has a conscious effect, but that's not conscious to the psychopath is what I'm trying to tell y'all. But they're being motivated by the same I sort of don't mechanisms. Uh, it's being fueled purposively by both, but in one is conscious and the other is not. I love the example that you made about the art museum and appreciating art. Psychologists can't appreciate art like normal people. That is so true, psychopaths. So this conscious effect is not, they're not feeling this. But it's not stopping them from doing the behavior. Is that not scary to you? It's very scary to me. Because they're it's shifted into all of their other endeavors as well. Now sexual immorality has been lifted and they can just go out to whatever they want and spread whatever disease, all the while not dealing with their uh, lack of commitment and, and trust issues and abandonment issues. And I just seeing so many men walking around here with insecurities and feeling so doubtful and timid in themselves and their energies are off balance because when I walk past them, they get so frustrated, um, fidgety, finicky. And I think that is going to only get worse if we don't sort of help them, correct them with love. They're not accepting themselves and they're living with this unconscious guilt and shame. So the defense mechanism is to fuck it out. Is this psychopath being aware of this? Is it having a conscious effect of him, of healing, feeling the humiliation that is accompanied with the decision to precariously indulge in this act? But I took this in a whole nother direction, but it's dealing with the psychopath, right, in all areas of his life. Yeah, cool story, right? I didn't think I was going to be interested in this book, actually. I read the whole thing when I first read it years ago, maybe six years ago. I never got back to this. Um, but I'm seeing psychopaths in my environment. I'm scared. I don't know where you live at, but where I'm living at, we got a real true mental illness running around all over. It's rampant all over our cities. Can you imagine like Twilight Zone zombies walking around? Uh, I need your energy. Hey, bitch, give me $2. I suck your dick for $2. I'm a robot. I just malfunction. <laughs> and this is all going on on the train at 8 a.m. When you're just trying to go to Starbucks. Yeah, before you can even get to the park to see the daffodils, you got to see dumbass buffoons. So this is where I'm living. This is my environment. It's very toxic. It's very chaotic. I want to understand this from a clinical sense. I'm not a psychologist. I'm just trying to read this book. I'm just trying to understand what the hell is going on out here. But what I also remember realizing that this man, men are being complicit about everything. Uh, six African American women is found dead in Gambia, and you see that the African American men are not even standing up for women in general. So it ain't got nothing to do with 
those women being African to why they don't are not protecting uh, against male misogyny and femicide in these countries. They just don't respect women at all. So this is translated due to the functions of their brain to just go after the objects of their real desires and where the aggressions are really being fueled through all those insecurities and their resentments for the mother and these edible conflicts and not being able to conquer the father. And we cannot say that we're not dealing with these as a culture when I'm approaching these in our secular practices, allow the man to face courage and his fears. And we're just living in other denials and scapegoating and regressions that God is just trying to get y'all to see is creating a demonic male. We're fueling the narcissism in him and we're aiding this demonic male. And I think we're dealing with psychopathy. Y'all ready for me to go ahead and continue on reading now? <laughs> You see why I can't read comments? Because it distracts me. That could that didn't get that go like that's Damanidi. 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 Leave me alone. I think I distract you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. I was just trying to prove to you I get distracted. It's because of this neurodiversity. And I had to go to the emergency room yesterday as well. I'm just being injured in my toe, and now it's my forearm. First it was my brain. All right. All right, so we were talking about love. So these are handicapped where he's comparable to that of one, however wise and learned, who must undertake to make love chiefly with his intellect. There is no proof of it, but some reason to wonder if this boy gradually realized the fact this is this boy with these ineffective parents who might be autistic, allegedly. We're not talk, saying that they really were autistic, but the clinician seems to think that they were autistic. These parents and how they raised their child were now trying to, I guess, look or surmise or comprehend in the boy's nature any effects of how these parents or the parents neglect in that child's life, right? as a boy is growing up trying to surmise the absence of love and how that translates to him seeking out love. How can he seek out things that he doesn't understand? Available cues are, are tenu tenuous, tenuous or tenuous. The apparent facts are not always unequivocal. There are, however, some indications that not by severity, but by over generous praise and Com commendations that their child was encouraged to accomplish a good deal more than he could without undue effort and weaning sphincter control and in subsequent matters he was somewhat precocious for a number of years he seemed so responsive to the fears of disappointing his parents that to the goal of pleasing them that overt measures to control or correct him were seldom needed. He appeared to be a very happy, affectionate child when disquieting manifestations began in his teens and, and the parents, startled and unprepared, tried valiantly to correct the situation. Sometimes leniency seemed proper. Sometimes judicious penalties were imperative. Since no course of action seemed to help at all, it is not necessary to presume, presume that they were particularly unwise because they tried many. Aside from complex situations like that to which references have just been made, many incidences come to mind in the lives of such patients, which might contribute rather obviously to their malfunctionings. I'm so interested in this. These 
as they are reconstructed 10, 20, or 30 years later, may not be identical in every small point with what occurred, but there is good reason to feel that they are very approximations. Let us list in the barest details a few among many. A boy of six, having seen the word P, Y, scrawled on fences and having noted that it aroused interest, carefully printed out the five letters on a scrap of paper and slipped it to a girl sitting near him in the schoolroom. She took it at once to the teacher who marched to the boy dramatically from the class to the principal and from whom he received a sound thrashing. At home that night, he mentioned at the supper table that he received a whipping in school. When asked why, he gave the straight story and still ignorant of its meaning, pronounced boldly and forbidden words. His father, stony face, arose, took him up upstairs and with no explanation before or after repeated, repeated with far more thoroughness and the principal's earlier punishment. A couple of years later, the same boy now spending the night at the house of a preacher's of a preacher, widely known for his interest in young boys and their problems, was confused, startled, and horrified by the adult's attempt to perform fellatio with him. He ran from the house, feared the return home, spent the rest of the night in a barn. Later, he was severely punished for having left the preacher's house without permission and under what seemed to the family rather odd circumstances. <laughs> You think? <laughs> he was afraid to tell what happened. He did not, in fact, know just how to tell it. <laughs> it is not surprising that parental parenting or spoiling has been thought of as a possible cause for the psychopath's later behavior. Oh, yeah, now they're going to blame it on spoiling the child. Let me take this silver spoon out of your mouth. <laughs> it is true that in many respects, these patients suggest a badly spoiled self-centered child who insists on having his way immediately without regard of costs to others or to their rights. It is true that these extremely pampered children tend not to weigh properly the unpleasant consequences logically to be expected from carrying out injudious acts. The overindulge and overprotective parents by intervening spare them the painful effects in such situations and this tends to spare them also some learning that they will need. It has been surprising to me that reliable evidence of such overprotection and giving way to every whim has not been found more often in the background of the psychopaths referred to in this volume. This is not to say that this such evidence is rare but it has not been regularly obtainable or sufficiently strong to encourage one to feel that the cause of the disorder can be accounted for simply on such a basis. It must not be forgotten that a good deal indicating excess of pampering can be obtained by thoroughly investigation of many other people in their early years. There is good evidence indicating that one of the most badly disordered of the patients mentioned here was extremely pampered by a grandmother who lived in the same house with him during his infancy and early childhood. She probably was in the close contact with him than his mother and was more often responsible for his care. There is reason to believe that she spent most of her time gratifying his every impulse immediately, actively entertaining him and bundling him excessively. Bundling. In her estimate, he could do no wrong. Friends of the family 20 years later recalled that when she was out pushing him in a carriage, he howled with exasperations if she stopped for a moment to speak with some acquaintance. <laughs> she did not attempt to stop after the first few times, but allowed him to keep her constantly going. Finding it to his taste when she shook or jiggled the carriage, he began to cry even when the carriage was in motion, unless she also kept it jiggling. <laughs> in other respects, it seems that she was similarly overindulgent. 
How much this factor contributed to the parents' later difficulties, I am not prepared to say. During her entire childhood, and now we're going to talk about the grandmother now. This is why I love psychology, because it goes back in the family tree. Oh, yeah, we got to go back to these great-great-grandparents, who kind of people they were. During their entire childhood, the entire, the adolescence, during the entire childhood and adolescence, a girl found herself competing with an older sister who not only made high remarks in school. Oh, well, this is a completely different story. My bad. <laughs> Disregard. But that is so true. I learned this in psychology. Our family trees, we had to go all the way back antecedently to as far as we can remember. And this was the reason how I it, it triggered me to go to Mississippi to meet my great grandfather for the first time. I'm sorry, my grandfather for the first time. For the first time in my whole life, I had met my grandfather simply by a family tree that I did. And I realized I didn't know who my grandfather on my father's side was. He was alive, living there. And literally a year later, after I went to go see him, he suddenly died. <laughs> so that's how life works. Isn't it so funny? So this is a completely dismissed story. During her entire childhood and adolescence, a girl found herself competing with an older sister who not only made high remarks in school, but also was notably charming, talkative, and in the life of the party. Failing to approach the sister's record at school, she redoubled her efforts to be equally and brilliant conversationally and gracious and, and spectacular. A style of behavior spontaneous in the sister became what might be called as automatic affectation. Whatever that means. In the younger child, in the younger girl, this was not evident as self-consciousness or stiltedness, but on the contrary, emerged as a particularly glib basimil of high spirits and dominant charm. In a sense, this charm worked. Little sister was very popular indeed, but she was she was popular indeed, but she was primarily competing rather than expressing herself and what enjoyment she obtained was from pure contest rather than in real human relations. She could not to her own satisfaction, displaced the elder sisters from her position in her parents' esteem. So this is just a rivalry that's going on within the sisters. The world, as conceived by the patient, could not be made over to contain both girls happily. The contest was gradually shifted, unsatisfied by the returns that registered on the emotional scoreboard, the ingenious competitor found that convenient changes had begun to occur in the rules. The very nature of the strife became not what she here to for in her less complete comprehension fancied it to be. New ways of scoring revealed themselves. Goals formerly unseen were discovered. Goals were accessible and practicable. In fresh areas and directions of activity, it was not only easy to outshine the smug, tinsel goddess, but th these improved features and new aspects altered dimensions and horizons beautifully revolutionized and frustrating horse and buggy world from which she found escape. She not only excelled, but found the now streamlined contest in, in itself and had a queerly satirical critique of antiquated mirage in which Big Sister was left floundering, illicit impregnations by a Nazi war prisoner who escaped. She assisted abortion, marriage to a man who honored and adored her, seduction of a middle aged in itinerant preacher and of a husband's young uncle all came in sequence. The husband traveled and she sometimes passed the week into the hotel being lightly enjoyed in fornication by celebrating members of a fraternal order and convention. Other weeks in, she might devote a group of Girl Scout brownies skillfully coaching them in bird study and in, 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 in 
incidentally, incidentally giving sound advice about the problems and adventures of growing up. This is another story he brings up. Sorry if this is starting to get boring. Almost constantly during the last year, a well-behaved boy had brooded a good deal about sexual words, innuendos, and scraps of conversations. In all other respects, he was an accepted member of a group. He was good at games and lively in spirit. A long time before, after he naively asked the meaning of a forbidden word, his mother, her face a little flushed, told him never to say that again and asked him never to join in discussions when boys use words, such words, or did those things. His father, who had taught him to swim before any of the other fellows could, then dropped from time to time, puzzling but impressive general remarks about manliness, clean minds and bodies, about activities that by implications were made to seem more vile than what many any words could specifically designate. His father at all other times so naturally and hearty despite brave efforts at casualness seemed like another person who reference was made to these matters. A peculiar formality and restraint closed off the subject, made it entirely impossible to inquire further. Soon a guilty, inexplicable embarrassment arose to block or distort every impulse to seek information from people about anything related to these mysteries. I guess he's just talking about sex. <laughs> we not going to talk about it. The mysteries. The puzzlement. Though he was on his honor about this matter more than about any other, he could not resist his impulse to pick up every bit of data he could from what the fellow said. He often prolonged his time in the schoolyard latterings to overhear some of the allusions and the suggestive but still bewildering remarks so often made there. Being on his honor, he could not join freely in such talk or ever use one of the words, but by indirect he picked up a good deal. His painfully maintained aloofness on this one subject led the, led the others. In a sort of teasing to turn the conversation toward it, then mysteriously to break off, smiling or giggling at the chagrin he could not quite hide, though his embarrassments helped cloak his guilty but frantic interests. When he first learned long before that his own parents was must necessarily have done something of this sort, though probably not quite what the boys talked about. He had not only felt that the whole world was filthy, but also feared everything good must be a mocking fraud. Even the memory of those feelings had blurred over the years, and he now usually skipped the inclusions of that awful fact that he thought with warm and tender affections of his lovely, perfect mother of, of dead, who was not only the finest man that ever lived, but also the strongest. Some had laughed when he explained that dead could, with one blow of his fist, knock the front door to the, to the school, not only down, but all in pieces. They didn't know that his dead was actually like, or how much fun he could make you have. He had been recently worrying an awful a lot about his mother. Dead was worried too. Though he tried not to show it when he found mother crying, he couldn't get her to explain what was the matter. Time after time, he would come in suddenly with, from the yard and surprise her, looking out the window with silent tears streaming down her face. Once in the middle of an afternoon, she was lying across the bed, her arm held tight across her face, her whole body shaking as she sobbed. And there was that time after she'd been having those terrible headaches and before the doctor had said that she didn't really have a tumor on her brain. That time he was so wary that he couldn't go to sleep and heard them both speaking to each other's terrible ways to each other. He couldn't believe it that is dead. He couldn't believe it was dead and mother. 
That's why he went down the hall and stood outside the door to make sure. When the cook was talking over the phone and the other cook to the other cook, he found out more about how it concerned that mother and how the cook felt so sure that they was doing some kind of horrible and dirty thing that all tied in with what he heard mother say that night about dead, dad's killing her and her wanting to be dead. The worst monstrosities that came into his thoughts, he denied or evaded, but always his fears and speculations ran through shameful and foul regions indicated by the things he heard at school. He had a fairly accurate idea about that act some of the words referred to and was glad to know now that it didn't go to where he first thought it did a long time before, for a good while after. Well, I'm curious about what this is now. He must be talking about sodomy or something. For, for a good while after, he thought maybe the baby came out there. Oh, he's just talking about sex. <laughs> As if it's JJ. <laughs> it's like top secret to him. For a good while after. <laughs> For a good while after he thought maybe the baby came out there, he didn't put all his scraps of information into any consistent pattern when he tried to make them fit like the pieces of a jigsaw puzzle, they became, they began to shape into a picture he simply couldn't face. He could, he found himself excited and gratified by accidental, sudden contact with paradoxically de, de, delicious fragments of this awful carrion, which seemed to flow all about through the medium in which he lived. He tried to avoid it in his thoughts, but he couldn't tell it was near until he touched him. Often he seared and defiled him simultaneously, but again another bit would arouse and thrill him imperatively. For instance, those sensations when he was climbing the tree and how they con connected with his vivid thoughts about the sixth grade girl who'd been tactfully reproved by the teacher during study period about jiggling her leg. The teacher had given a little talk later that ladies behaving that in, so that gentlemen would always think of them as creatures with shoes attached to the hems of their skirts. The teacher was right because that's the way you thought of mother. But the rhythm of that big girl's leg ran almost like something scalding through his senses and fancy breaking away like a horse in panic swept under the skirt tried tried to avoid correlations with the shock of that picture in the old anatomy book. Then accepted and embraced an imagination more vivid than ordinary perceptions, the very details and qualities that were most disgusting and found them indescribably, indescribably sweet to his taste. After that, every night when he said that his prayers, he put a good deal about his help, about help in his struggle against being as he was. He prayed, see that's where that religious guilt come in and the conflictions of his sort of secondary sex drives is now being inextricably cut off and shut off to, to them being forbidden in him. And he's praying to God right now <laughs> about the things that he feels himself to be. And there's a lot of men are doing this right now. He prayed as long about that as he did for dad and mother to be all right and to be happy again. No longer a perfunctory habit. His prayers had become earnest and long. Perfunctory, I think, means more like wished for, like a wished for dream or something. This was like more of a wished for habit perfunctory yeah hope for that's what it means per uh carried it means carried out with a minimum of effort or 
reflection, brief, hasty, hurried. Characterized by routine or superficiality. Routine, what did I say? Routine, lacking in interest or enthusiasm. So that is like they're saying, is the function, does perfunctory mean um, routine? Characterized by routine or superficiality. So I was right, lacking in interest or enthusiasm. So it would be like a menial task, like sweeping or doing laundry. Oh, oh I'm sorry. I was thinking of kumarik. Kumarik. So much more do I got in this chapter? All right, so I got a lot to read, and I got to get my energy up, guys. Let me just take a break real quick. Even the memory of those feelings had blurred over the years. And he now usually, once in the middle of the school, when the cook was, it was a fairly accurate idea about that act of some of the words referred to. He had a fairly accurate idea about that act of some of the words referred to and was glad he knew now that it didn't go to where he at first thought it did in a long time before. The teacher was right, because that's the way you thought of mother. After that, every night when he said his prayers, okay, this is where I left off at. When ideas about his, about this woman who had something to do with the mysterious and terrible trouble came to his mind, he found himself silently using some of those filthy words of hate. Nothing less could embody his rage toward anybody who harmed mother and dead and his impulse to protect them and to retaliate. He wouldn't admit that dead himself was really doing any of the things like those that haunted the fringe of his mind. He wouldn't admit it, but down underneath, he knew that some sort of act to occur, dad would have to be in his in on them too. He asked God to forgive him not for hating that woman, but for the words. He wasn't after all like actually saying them, but he would do his best to stop. Now, a lot of things happen in succession. His young aunt, a small but generously developed and very sexually interested, interesting girl in her late teens, spent the week in. She playfully pulled him on her lap, half tussled with him, and have embraced him. She was fond of him, was non erotically teasing, but also she probably had a good many more sex impulses behind this than she realized. She felt like nothing had touched, she felt like nothing he had touched before and more that way than anything he had ever imagined. Later, he couldn't help but steal a lingering look at her through the half-open door as she lay reading on the chaise lounge in her room. She had on only an almost transparent nightgown. It was sort of pulled up a little and half slipped off at her shoulder, and her soft legs was carelessly disposed, pri privacy being presumed. 
He did not see enough to answer any of the questions that had for so long been stimuli of cringing shame and agonizing delight. But he sensed as he never sensed before something about what this worst of all sin might be. He was far from ignorant about the general, general, generalities. He had picked up a good deal about the boys talking. And of course, he'd seen not only the chickens, but the dogs too. <laughs> er? Elements of the picture that emerged, he'd reject. Deleting something here, blurring this, distorting that. After all, people are an animal's beast. <laughs> he was sure he'd never come near such an act before because it would show up in your face. But that night in bed, he did something with his hand while his thoughts smothered and etched into the vivid image of his aunt and of the sixth grade girl, and of the substitute teacher who'd cross her leg on the platform. With such heat and lascivious adherence that it almost seemed he might destroy all three of them in his paradoxium of vile delight. He was like a man so frantic and famished with thirst that he gulped at all the poisoned water he could reach, knowing perfectly well one drop would be fatal. But you know it's good when you've had more than enough, right? <laughs> the poison. <laughs> Afterward, he sprang out of bed, fell on his knees, and began to beg to God over and over to strike him dead if he ever again should do such a thing. And these are his, these are these conflicts of interest. The very next afternoon, while he was skating with the fellows in a park, the dogs started that business. And though he pretended not to join the half dozen who gathered about, he stayed near and surreptitiously watched. The sight and the overheard comments filled him with a shuddering fascination when one of the bigger, bigger, biggest boys took something out of his pocket and several of them approached the dog, no longer in activity, but forlornly joined. He did not grasp what was planned. The turpentine was applied and the dog cried out in agony. The new impact of the horror drowned all his other sensations. He loved the dog. He loved dogs. In the whooping laughter of the boys, he found a cruelty as triumphant as it was vile and terrifying. Kicking off his skates, he ran with all of his might across the grass to get a shortcut to his wild flight from home. For home. There an event of some magnitude was taking place. His father, after breaking off the relations that so distressed and humiliated his mother, had over a period of time at last convinced her of his sincerity. She had not, however, until now been able to let herself have physical contact with him. It was the anniversary of their wedding. The man had come home early and unexpected from his office, had given his wife a letter and touched something inside she thought was dead, <laughs> like her feelings. <laughs> In her bedroom, tacked with the roses that came as a surprise, she turned to him at, in a burst of feelings long unfamiliar to her. Acts followed with a fervor beyond anything either of them could remember both as if trying to make up for a long period of misery and mistrust threw themselves into every refinement and extension of passionate device to prolong the anticipy and fulfilling that was welcomed as a loved one might be who arises from the dead. <laughs> this is so funny. <laughs> Do I still have your attention, Vamanini? <clears throat> oh, what edition? It's 2015. Oh. It doesn't have an edition on here, it's just a book. Is that helping you? Oh, second edition. Do you see it? Good question. 
I never knew that. It's a good book. So I'm in it. I'm interested now. Second edition, okay? Or where I'm at. Nothing less could embody his rage toward anything. Now a lot of things happen to blah, blah, blah. Now, a lot of things happened in succession. His young aunt spent the week. Oh, I already said that. There was an event of some magnitude was taking place. His father was breaking off the relations. Oh, now, now where his father's coming home for their anniversary. And they engage in this wild, passionate, unbrittled sex. That's what we're into. And they're uh, unwakening the dead. <laughs> they're wakening the dead, apparently. Uh, so they're further beyond anything either of them could remember. Okay. Welcomed as loved ones might who be who arises from the shore of their privacy, for their son was not due back until at least an hour later. <laughs> Neither sought to curtail any expression of what it was so good to feel this boy fighting back tears as he sought after his mother was arrested outside the open French door, which offered the best access to our room by way of the upstairs porch. Unable to enter afraid for a while, even to risk the noise of withdrawal, he received the full impact of what has been called the primal scene. Ah! <laughs> In another case, attempting to look back. Oh, this is another story. In another case, attempting to look back through the preceding 25 years of a young woman's life, we encounter evidence of a very different set of influences. In her earliest, earliest memory loomed warning not to shout or play noisily on Sunday. Her parents were not considered fanatical or bigoted by the community. Her father was in fact noted for his wit and merriment as a speaker at luncheon clubs. He always had a cordial word for everyone he encountered in the locker room at the golf club, often a half-hearted, a hardened or pleasantly teasing quip, sometimes a de delicately risked story. He never seemed to be thinking about sin and damnation and did not tend to talk about morals or religion. His wife, too, had a sparkle in her eye, dressed attractively, and was the envy of her garden club. Though regular members of the church rather liberal in its views, they also belonged to an unofficial interdominational group. Interdenominational group. They had belonged to it since before their daughter's birth. As in most other activities, they early became leaders in the affairs of this group. Most of its tenants they applied affably affably i think that means like fond of good people good nature good just convivial like talkative everybody's in a social group i guess easy to get easy going easy to talk to that's what that word means affably so this is what the tenants had applied that these this man and woman, his wife, were affably, but consistently to the rearing of their children. Okay. So they knew, so in the midst of talking, they knew how to turn around and like, sit your ass down. Wait till we get home. <laughs> so that's just a way of discipline. <laughs> they give them the look. Susan. <laughs> I don't know how the Indians do. <laughs> Black people just straight out hit your ass. Hit your ass now. <laughs> I'm sorry. He's never like this in public. <laughs> what do you mean? Traumatized? <laughs> yeah. 
as he walking out with the black eye. <laughs> All right, don't get distracted, Cornelius. All right, where we at? All right. Their oldest, whose case we are considering, found her way blocked at every turn as she sought to do as the other girls did. One must not attend the moving picture. These, according to a major premise of the group, are often improper and irregular, irreligious, irreligious, irreligious. Even those films free of such qualities, some perhaps intrinsically good in their message, must be avoided because attendance would be an act supporting the Hollywood system, including the evil of divorce, the profligate living of divorcees, and all sorts of unchristian principles. No movie and no dancing, not even at the YWCA, where it is, however, entirely wholesome to indulge in volleyball, calisthenics, and paddle tennis must one participate in this improper activity. Dancing is, after all, a practicing whereby young men and women arouse improper feelings and attitudes in a hypocritically disguised form of lascivious contact and furthermore, contact with motion. <laughs> Where am I at, though? Oh, he kind of goes off on these like kind of tangents. It's like he uses like these metaphors and he'll just go off on them. I'm sorry about this. This is, I like the way he writes, so there were no habitually stern countenances, no re regular tirades or sin scourging sermons in this particular home with an almost jesting light, light, lightness of touch, such as some might use to point out an obvious bubbles of low grade morons. These parents tolerantly explained the error of such practices. There were other silly and dangerous things too that these happy, jo jolly people naturally avoided. Diet was an important matter. Certain meats were avoided in some seasons. This vegetable and that fruit were especially desirable. Vitamins, if one is to utilize their real worth, must be obtained through an intricate and extremely scientific pattern of diet. If this is followed, the body receives particularly valuable in ingredient, ingredients which reinforce each other, augmenting vitality and enhancing specifically the human organism's spiritual capacities. Experimentations have proved that vitamins should be utilized not merely to fill the ordinary needs generally recognized as present, but also in seasonally changing combinations, the harmonic method. There were magazines too, advanced for such any for just anybody to understand that came from a distant metropolis. These points out these pointed out such truths along with important rituals of breathing ryth rhythmically while doing certain exercises soon after waking up and of repeating as one breathed little prayers for happiness, for forgiveness, for good remarks at school, for richer spiritual awareness, for financial success, or for the wind on grandmother's neck to disappear through soul force from God. There were phonographs, records to play while one prayed or exercised. These helped one breathe in proper rhythm and spoke out the things for, for you. Sometimes it was fun to talk along with the record. Sometimes you just thought it out. Expect for curtail, curtailments of activity on Sunday. But it wasn't right to shout or yell, even if you were tickled. Much of it in the patient earlier years was so far as she could remember, regarded as a kind of fun, as she got a little older, most of the practices, both positive and negative, began to seem irksome, wearisome, and usual kind of bathing suits, going to the movies or eating shrimp with milk were apparently more or less the same as 
as stealing, lying, or the imperfectly understood kind of infidelity associated with Judas Iscariot. Murder, deep hypocrisy, robbery, lying, and momentous matters were not underestimated by these genuinely ethical adults. Such sins must to them, much to them, have seemed to remote a danger to those living on really high religious planes. And it was naturally more practical to concentrate attention on the smaller but more likely potentialities of error. These less obvious, but just as surely they felt dull and finally destroy the capacity to live a truly Christian life. It had been fun to follow the special rules for living in the spirit for a while. <laughs> Daddy and mom seemed to be right and know so much about than other people. They didn't try to bother others. It was important to be polite and tolerant, not to show pride or superiority because others led ignorant and worldly lives. God was kind and forgiving and only he could judge others. Having the truth was a responsibility and a privilege rather than a favor about which to be vain. She could remember when it used to be fun to choose, choose certain foods so many times with Daddy counting and Mom sometimes winking at 10, 20. <laughs> he did good, son. <laughs> But as years passed and began to wonder, a skepticism not clearly recognized as such developed and began to spread, finally permeating the entire area of the right versus the wrong. This invisible but progressive reaction was sometimes stimulated by contact with people not practicing the real spiritual life, who prospered, who were attractive, and who seemed anything but sinful derelicts some of her contemporaries, whose parents were even more successful than her own, occasionally spoke lightly or joked about many of the major points stressed as essential to acceptable conduct, to a worthwhile life. It became necessary to lie. It never really hurt anybody. There was no real need to call it a lying. It could You could avoid arguments with the family about whether or not the picture showed that be vitiated spiritual reactivity by merely saying you were going out to see the tulips in the park. <laughs> and perhaps also that you intend to breathe rhythmically and in proper counterpoint, repeat prayers for the soul of that little brother who had been taken back by God before he was even born. A thoughtful physician who had examined this young woman said, End quote. It seems that she had to lie about such little things and about such urgent things for so long that she really lost awareness of when she was lying and when she was not. End quote. There was no distinct conflict, shame, or hurt that she could recall about deceiving her parents when she began such practices. She had thoroughly hoodwinked both parents for years in rather serious matters before the first detection after they began to find evidence of their daughter's distinctively unspiritual activities, they were kind, reasonable, and forgiving, and worked steadfastly to help her make a better adjustment. Ah, shit, that bitch! <laughs> they did not underestimate the antisocial, self-damaging act or our almost total incapacity to integrate truthfully into her conduct. It is true. That means to take the accountability because she's a psychopath, right? <laughs> it is true that like most parents, they fail to discover most of the daughter's particularly regrettable escapades. Apparently, they were wise enough and good enough to realize that violent condemnation, perpetual criticisms and warnings cannot be affectatious as a remedy for the for the lying and irresponsibility that circumstances forced to their attention. Excuse me.
God. Like you're alive. What are you doing? <laughs> I'm just doing errands, <laughs> doing my laundry. Oh, I'm on live. Ah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm back now. <laughs> what do you mean people are watching me? Like right now, right now? <laughs> I'm sorry. Where's the editing when you need one? <laughs> but I still got you. Sorry if I'm butchering your name. Can I just call you TV? You still there? This is visible. Booker is reactions. Where am I at? This invisible progressive reaction was sometimes stimulated by contact with people not practicing the real spiritual life. Where am I at? A thought physician had examined. They did not underestimate the antisocial, okay? Had they been the ordinary sense, they were consistently judicious and behaved after recognizing evidence of their daughter's disorder with what truly deserves to be called compassionate understanding. Okay, so yes. So this is what I was talking about. Apparently they were wise enough and good enough to realize that violent condemnation, the perpetual criticisms and warnings cannot be efficacious, efficacious as a remedy for the lying and the irresponsibilities that circumstances forced to their attention. They were consistently judicious and behaved after recognizing evidence of their daughter's disorder with what truly deserves to be called compassionate understanding. Had they been in the ordinary sense fiercely fanatical people prone to call down God's wrath and scathing human punishments on the center more obvious factors would appear in a routine psychiatric history to account for a pattern of rebellion in the child. Perhaps this pattern might also have been more consistent, more successfully purposive, and perhaps it might have led equally to some accountable form, acceptable form of life. To paraphrase Lindy Lindner again, perhaps as a rebel, she might have found some cause to embrace. Although when highlighted by some in account as we have given, the attitudes and the conduct of this child's parents may seem foolish, fanatical, or even bizarre. In a more detailed presentation, they would appear quite different. I have attempted to give the scene in those aspects met by these particular, particular daughter as she emerged from infancy into childhood and on into adolescence. Looking at this father and mother from all available aspects, one tends to feel that they were less narrow, less fanatical, etc., in many important respects than the average. It is true that they, they followed and they encouraged their child to follow many rules regarding regarded by the community as eccentric, puritanical, puritanical, and impractical. This part of this ethics and religion is the religion does not appear to have been taken as equivalent by the parents in matters to matters and issues generally recognized as fundamental. The belief in practices which viewed in the circumscribed focus of our inquiry, like in their religion, seem to dominate their lives. Become, when the whole picture is visible, relatively minor. In many important respects, they were not prudish. In almost no respects were they particularly harsh, intolerant, or condemning, genuinely stimulated in what nearly all impartial observers would call important religious reactions by their experience with the sectarian groups. They embraced all of its teachings with sincerity. It is probable that they have possibly benefited from this experience. Not caring for the strong drink or tobacco, only moderately interested in the movies or the stage, it cost them relatively little to forego such amusements. They had found so much comfort and health, healthy stimulus from the religious attitudes and practices acquired through the cult 
that it seemed plausible to follow the rules fairly and fully. Accepting the teachings in an important sense, it would have been hypocritical of them to evade responsibility or to violate rules which they creed, which the creed insisted on as essential. They did not themselves equate in significance the rules about the small matters with such principles as do unto others as you would have others do unto you. The efforts to put vital matters above ephemeral pleasures and to avoid the latter, if necessary to do so, can hardly be despised. It was not difficult for them to follow the rules in small things as well as in large. It is not altogether unnatural for parents to want their child to be as nearly perfect as possible, to be not only passable, successful for superiors, to be fine in basic integrity, and if possible, a paragon, even by standards too high for most. This man and woman got to what was perhaps the equivalent of a school highball, the recreation of an evening at the movies or at a dance, or many of the minor practices advised by the cult. The dietary thought that the use of respiratory rhythm with rituals of prayer, etc., they followed for some years but long, long ago abandoned. The cult itself, like most first organizations, modified many of its early rules. This was seldom, if ever, done by frank recantations, but by a gradual diminution of emphasis of certain matters. During the time that dietary plans were adopted, knowledge of nutrition was not what it is today, and many details of belief and practices in the cult, looking back from today, seems more eccentric than they did at the time. It is true, like many other groups of apparently happy people who bring up many well-adjusted children, they never modify their beliefs that a good many popular pastimes like dance, reading and comments on the Lord's day, etc., are definitely wrong and incompatible with the Christian life according to their personal convictions. As any honest man ought to know, ballroom dancing is distinctively stimulating to Frank's, Frank, to Frank's sexual impulses. Whether or not this makes it unchristian is another question. <laughs> They were not, however, public crusaders who insisted on forcing or who even tactfully sought to persuade others to take the same position. Even after the daughter had forged many checks, spent the night in the police barracks of a nearby town for, for bowdy behavior attributed to alcohol, fornicated indiscriminately, and toyed half-heartedly a few times to very deviated acts with lesbians they would have been hurt and discouraged to learn that she attended a movie or a dance. But is it altogether unreasonable for persons in such a position to be uneasy on seeing a child take even a small step sincerely believed to be in the direction of depravity? Yeah, because of all this regression and guilt, this is what it all morphed into. All these inhibitions and man caused them to rebel in this way, unconsciously. So limiting themselves and restricting themselves in religion actually caused them to regress in a sense because they started to exhibit depravity and deplorableness in their own individual lives when the mother and the father never raised them to even be this way. To be honest and upright and righteous and pure, <laughs> You see where this goes paradoxically in nature? So in a way, we have to allow for some sort of freedom in ourselves to make mistakes, to liberate, to do liberating activities. Uh, don't go out, out and sin, but I'm getting sidetracked. I'm just This is all examples of how things paradoxically morph into when we try to run away from things, when we try to hold our feelings in when we don't let out and be vulnerable and trans real and authentic with our feelings, all this is going to do is suppress and deny. And all this is going to be the result of that is the suppression and denials. It's more on top of more and denials. And it's going to morph into erotic desires and fixations and all of this. 
they were probably not intelligent in efforts to have their daughters learn and really appreciate the value of giving an honest answer. Well, how is that possible when they were raised in well to be puritanical? No morals and values and stuff of not lying. Thou should not lie. Also, is in do unto others as you would like them to do unto you. Thou should not lie. That's one of the other commandments as well, right? They may not have spoken as often about this in her earlier years, about giving an honest answer, as about avoiding the Sunday comics at many of the novels and magazines enjoyed by the girl's friends. Truth was so fundamental and its rejection so obviously serious that smaller but more subtle and immediate dangers naturally called for greater emphasis or frequent warnings. And after all, repetitious preachments about honesty are scarcely the best means of instilling it. So that's the reason why they went to church a lot. Many think the child acquired true evaluations of the lie by observing the actual conduct of his parents in this matter. <laughs> there is no doubt that the girl now under discussion detected both of her parents in falsehoods. They informed her in what she took for utter seriousness that Santa Claus was a real man <laughs> and that he became all the way from the North Pole and climbed down the chimney she very earnestly labored at letters to him, and sure enough, he did not disappoint her. She may have been at this time an uncommonly serious and a rather grateful child for one Christmas Eve. She prepared a plate with turkey and hot rolls and carefully selected the most likely chimney, placed it on the earth. The next morning, the plate was clean. Both mom and dad gave their word that Santa Claus had eaten it. They delivered to her a note of thanks, sighed by the wonderful man himself. By and large, one is inclined to estimate that these parents told falsehoods and were detected in them a little less rather than more often than the average among people of good ethics. They did not often, if ever, tell deliberate or unequivocal lies about what to them seemed important matters. There is evidence which indicate that some matters crucial to the little girl were not considered important by the parents, as it probably in all religious matters, this man and woman sometimes rationalize or seem to confuse personal beliefs with objective proofs. To people whose convictions sharply differ with those of the speakers, such rationalizations often appear as lies of a particularly malign and hypocritical nature. As the little girl grew, she discovered more and more to convince her that the special dietary practices which her parents had assumed her would cause specific results did not such do such things. There are indications that at one time she believed the avoidance of certain foods and the taking of several others in combination would cause her to turn into a boy and that she had her parents' words for this. How clearly the parents understood what her wish was as a matter of I can only estimate. When mom lost the happily anticipated brother before he was even born, it seems that the little girl shared to an to an unnatural degree, the sorrow of her parents steadfastly. They assured her that the tiny brother was happy in heaven, safe with Jesus in a state of joy and security beyond anything imaginable on earth. This she was patient, patiently, and in the deepest kindness assured of a certainty as a certainty far beyond the limits of mathematical and scientific proof. Why daddy, why daddy? She once asked gently after a long period of wistful silence, aren't you and mom happy if you know he's there? Will anyone volunteer to answer this question wisely, merciful, mercifully, truthfully, convincingly? It is doubtful if the next man could have answered it in much better than her father did. Our patient did not apparently at first encounter many stimuli prompting her to deceive the parents about the important matter. Many of the rules about little things kept coming up 
and without deliberate planning, she fell into the habit of sparing the parents' pain and at the same time giving herself the chance to do what she what the other girls did. There is little evidence of a distinct or significant struggle or strong conscious conflict at any point in the revolt. This, it seems, extended gradually and as painfully as an operation under good local anesthesia until the chief emotional component that determines decision and conduct in major issues had become almost imperceptible. Unlike many patients with similar behavior patterns, she appeared as an adult surprisingly free from conscious hate or rejections of the parent. She is usually polite and in all small things considerate of them and with consistency remarkably in such a case, not only refuses to blame them for her difficulties, but often actively exonerates them. She seems aware only of grateful and affectionate feelings toward them. It must be admitted that these feelings seem to lack depth or substance. Certainly, there is lacking the quality that it enables emotions to play its ordinary role in the determination of conduct. Okay, so she could be experiencing some sort of disassociation with her emotions. There is no need to give in denial the history of this patient's typical and repeated act that show objectively her grave disability. Her story is so like those already recounted that little would be gained by saying more, and that is particularly impressive. A few points about this case, perhaps, deserves a little additional speculation. Had the patient in her earlier years been stimulated to revolt and rejections by influences less subtly mixed, might she have ever not have better discerned the sources and the nature of her stimuli? Might she not have isolated what was reacting to and behaved more purposively and effectively toward it? Many major and many... That's a good question. Let me go back to this question again. A few points about this case perhaps deserves a little additional speculation. Had the patient in her earlier years been stimulated to revolt and rejection by influences less subtly mixed and rejection by influences less subtly mixed, Oh, so has she been less rejected in her life? So she has she been more accepted? And has she revolted against the injustice of her unnurturing and unloving family members? All the while getting, I guess, the support of outside friends and peers and things like this are in therapy. Might she not have better discerned the sources? And the nature of her stimuli, i.e., has she not been aware of her emotions and feelings and while she's doing things unconsciously? That is antisocial and personality, psychopathic ideation, uh, these tendencies that we're unconsciously unaware of. I didn't understand a lot of my psychopathic ideations was coming from just not having unnurturing family members that never attuned, that misattuned with me. And this lack of attenuation didn't allow me to be in touch with my feelings, my emotions, what I was feeling. I had no comprehension, understanding of none of this. So I was like a psychopath in a sense. Because I didn't understand the source of the nature of the stimuli that I was feeling, like aggressions was stimulating masochistic behavior unconsciously. <laughs> and I was reacting to this behavior propulsively and effectively toward it. This is the same thing that's going on with her. But had she, I guess the question is, has she had, I guess, recognition of this and has she revolted against this earlier on? But why wasn't this feeling of injustice impinged on her is the question. Are we dealing with, I guess, a, a, a sensory disability and ex, or to where she, or she's crippled in her sensory of feeling emotions because she's misattuned and she's in an unnurturing environment. This is what it does. It shut off the left hemisphere of the brain. And you don't feel these executive functions like love, capacity for love and attachments with people. This is so detrimental. 
many major and many minor issues. I'm sorry for that side, but I just got sidetracked with my own thoughts. Many major and many minor issues from her viewpoint had, as a child appear as if woven into a tapestry she could only perceive as homogenous. As she felt her way along the experience, she soon found not one but many bits of this fabric unacceptable. She read the funny papers surreptitiously on Sunday. Okay, am I skipping? And slipped off to the movies in the general attitude of the world. She found confirmation of her estimation estimate that such activities were not only pleasant but harmless. Having okay, so now she's on a rigid lifestyle regiment now for a sense of safety predictability this is how this rigid lifestyle starts to happen right having found deception not very painful in its repeated application to the solutions of all her earlier problems <laughs> let me repeat that having found deception not very painful in its repeated application to the solutions of her earlier problems <laughs> she continued its use until it became automatic and involuntary, an integral part of her behavior as she later attempted to deal with problems of another order. So she just continued on with the self-deception in her life. Pressure and conscious conflicts that might have brought into better focus the real difference between, say, left, theft and shouting on Sunday, between dancing and fornication did not develop. Things went too smoothly for a while on the surface as the objective result of unacceptable behavior began to accumulate. A serious leveling of emotional reactivity had apparently already begun. Okay. And we can actually call this emotional reactivity. Can we call this pathologic? in nature now, because it's happening chronically now, unconsciously. By the time she was first expelled from a school, it had already ceased to matter very serious, seriously to her. She had once left it a matter a great deal to her, whether or not she stroked faithfully to the right combination of vegetables during July, or really did not take a peek at the Sunday comics a change that might be properly called the development of unconscious callousness had to occur for her to avoid having the matter. This change, insidious and involuntary, but purposive, seemed to have extended over the entire range of her, of her reactivity. If her parents had possessed certain bad qualities they lack, she might have been able to focus better on what she to what to reject and to perceive more significantly what she was doing. Clearly distinguishable evil or significantly false signals in the Malou might have enabled her to chart some sort of sensible course. Had they severely punished her for little infractions or made themselves embarrassing to her by bigoted behavior in public, the hot feelings of hate or an over overtness of disagreements might have brought issues into the open, giving her definite points of reference by which to orient herself, right? Being more open with and letting her child, letting the child know what the actual infraction is this overt disagreements, having more arguments could have stimulated her to realize where the problem was and impose a shutting down. She might have revolted reactively from certain things rather than unwittingly withdrawing all deep and genuine emotional commitments from everything. Yeah, because she's not sure of her environment and she doesn't have a sense of real safety in her life. Wow, they did more damage to her by loving her intellectually. If the parents had behaved in such a way that she would identify them as fiendish, she might in an aimed withdrawal turn in some direction where goals of some importance might be discovered 
where strong and persistent motives might take root. From her interactions with the surrounding world, there emerged an image of life, its goals, its dangers, rights and wrongs, love, meanings, happiness and shame, etc., which she could accept superficially, but which was so largely a two-dimensional fabrication that she could not react to any part of it with deep and genuine emotional response, intentions, or performance. Her rejection, if it may be so termed, was not a consciously voluntary act. She was not in thought or verbally expressed judgments, cynical, immoral, bitter, or determined to make a travesty of life she made a positive attitude toward conventional ideas and goals and toward sanity. The attitude lacked not form, but it lacked substance in her. Had she revolted with more insight from features of life, she better distinguished, even if these had been fundamentally valuable points of reference, she might, despite many blunders, distortions, etc., have found some position compatible with the fairly well-adapted mode of existence. As things stood, it seems that she had exa exiled herself or somehow been exiled in the shallows. Her functioning was confined to a region in which the waters of life could float only what is trivial and ephemeral. Ephemeral means lasting a very short time. In contrast with this young woman situation, let us for a moment, and we're going to go into another story right now, and we're almost done, so I'm going to continue. In contrast with this young woman situation, let us for a moment glance briefly at another. Here we see what on the surface appears to be a similar pattern of maladjustments. The second young woman's career shows also pathologic promiscuity. Ooh, many evidences of serious irresponsibility and self-damaging behavior almost without purpose. These features are, however, more isolated. In trying to estimate the patient, one feels that this is not the whole of life to her. As investigation proceeds in its discovery, discovers that from age 13 to age 15, she was induced on many occasions by her father to submit to full sexual relations with him. He denied, which is hardly surprising, present himself in the guise of a lover with a minimum of explanation, but with an authoritative attitude. He coursed the bewildered and disgusted child in to compliance. These episodes, though not infrequent, were isolated by the father from everything else in the life of the family. No reference was ever made to them or to the question they so vividly raised. A successfully highly respected and otherwise conventional man, he maintained his habitual attitude toward her in the family group. His administrative and disciplinary functions were continued unchanged, and his manners showed no evidence of hypocrisy or consciousness or inconsistency. He continued to express moral disapproval of girls and boys staying out too late on dates, on necking, on smoking and drinking among teenagers. His position in such matters had never been extreme, and interestingly enough, it did not become either more or less severe during and after the years he persisted in the monumentally damaging activities with his daughter. It is not difficult to see how this experience alone might have contributed richly to the subsequent faulty adjustments of the girls over a good many years, or perhaps have been the major determining factor. It is of interest to us here to note that, though cynical and defiant in many important respects, this lady, unlike others, had a clear notion of what she felt this way about and why. It is also interesting to report that she apparently continued to gain insight, and she responded with very encouraging reactions to therapy and improved in her adjustments to the point where one can say that the outcome in this case was successful. Another case, if I may be allowed to 
paraphrase one of the most significant statements of Kurtzky and his appraisals of such factors from the viewpoint of general semantics, I might say that the human organism is personality development acquires its nutriments from an almost infinitely complex surrounding medium. And you can make sense of what that means. From this only can it obtain what is no less essential to growth and survival than protein, minerals, vitamins, oxygen, water, etc. are essential to bodily growth and survival. In the Malu are all of these valuable and vital ingredients. Here are also our ingredients are unsuitable for the purpose of human metabolism as are heroin, uh, cyanide, chloria, bacteria, the virus of encephalitis, etc. for the diet of the infants. When the poisonous or the otherwise damaging material can be distinguished from the nutritivity useful or necessary material, a healthy choice in use can be made. It is damaging to be fed or to be obtained and ingest a deleterious product. This, in both aspects of our analogy, always occur on many occasions in each human life. When the deleterious and vital ingredients are subtly mixed so that they are particularly difficult to distinguish, we have a particularly bad pathogenic situation. If the opposite type of materials are so ingeniously distinguished or formed that they appear identical and are compounded or integrated so that their isolation is not possible, disorder and malnutrition and infections, etc., it almost certain to occur. If the blending and the seasoning is so carried out that even the subjective effects are not recognized and accurately interpreted by the organism, then we have disease that is supremely difficult to handle with proxylaxis or therapy. At the 1949 meeting of the American Psychiatric Associations in Montreal, Dr. David L. Thomas of McGrill University made this statement, and quote, everything special and valuable as a gross and undesirable malady very similar to it and possessing the same name, only the very wise can distinguish between them. These words are pertinent to the problems of psychiatry in general and particularly pertinent to the regions we from time to time glimpse or sense behind our outer manifestations when we give serious attention to the so-called psychopath. The point made by Kurtzby and emphasized by others working with his method, as I believe a valuable applicability to psychopathologic patterns first elucidated by Freud and to the subsequent formulations of orthodox psychoanalysis as well as other casual influences, whether hip, hypothetic or established by evidence. The pathologic factors pointed out by Kirsby and held by him to be regularly important in human development and human maladjustments are not incompatible with Freudian psychopathology. The kinds of confusions and false appraisals of emphasized in general semantics, on the contrary, might be regarded as cal uh, catalytic or synergistic. Synergistic means cooperating or working together. Influences in the original blunders, which in psychoanalytic studies appear to be sources of conflict, often the initial steps in life patterns of personality disorder. What Kirsty and his following and followers emphasize about such aspects of human experience as those experienced by verbal symbols such as love, good and evil, etc., for instance, tend to make more comprehensible the extreme prevalence of Oedipal difficulties, ambivalence, contrast between conscious and unconscious aims, etc., encountered in psychoanalytic literature and indeed in all psychiatric practice. And that's the end of that, finally, guys. Uh, thank you for staying tuned, uh, TV, today. See you later. Bye.